1968 brought a startling development almost every month, and the month of March was no exception. CBS This Morning's John Dickerson, in his debut story for Sunday Morning, takes us back. What kind of a year was 1968? It was really a horrible year for the country. The action around Octo has been costly to the enemy. It was a hell of a year. President Lyndon Johnson mm. called it a year of continuous nightmare. Black smoke from riot fires in downtown Washington drifted over the White House. It is true that a house divided against itself is a house that cannot stand. As 1968 began, Johnson was in his fifth year in office. He had become president following the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Then was elected in 1964 by one of the largest margins in history. Now he was running for re-election. He could be compassionate and loving and caring about the poor, and he could be cruel and tough and ruthless. Joseph Califano was Johnson's top domestic aide. We used to say, people are moved by love and fear. You have to figure out the right mixture. Johnson had passed sweeping civil rights legislation and anti-poverty programs. But by 1968, the war in Vietnam overwhelmed him. While trying to engineer peace talks, he continued to send more troops. Anti-war protests were increasing, and increasingly personal. That really affected him. Former Senator Fred Harris from Oklahoma was a Johnson advisor. He began to feel really beleaguered, and I think he had this deep feeling, I'm not going to be the president that lost Vietnam. Our patience and our perseverance will match our power. Johnson had the power of incumbency, which kept his chief rival, Senator Robert Kennedy, and other Democrats from challenging him. But one largely unknown candidate did take him on. Gene McCarthy decides to run for president at the end of 1967. How big of a deal was it that he was running against a president of his own party? Well, you know, it, it, it was thought to be a futile uh, effort. Minnesota Senator Eugene McCarthy's platform was basically, end the war. I was the student coordinator of the campaign. Sam Brown was with McCarthy from the start. You know, the people just don't dig their leaders. I mean, <laughs> Lyndon Johnson and the union leadership are not where people are. A lot of us liked him because he was intellectual. He didn't play the game the way most politicians played the game. He was more likely to travel with a poet than he was with an advanced person. I mean, he was not your usual candidate. Brown moved his scruffy army of young people into New Hampshire ahead of the primary. It was 50 years ago tomorrow. If you wanted to come work for McCarthy in New Hampshire, you had to clean up your act. You had to cut your hair. You had to shave your beard. You had to dress respectably. You had to act respectably. So uh, it became kind of famous, the so-called claim for Jane. McCarthy had been expected to get 12% of the primary vote at most. But Johnson's optimistic talk about progress in Vietnam had been shattered by the Tet Offensive. The campaign became about the credibility of the Johnson presidency. McCarthy got 42% to Johnson's 48%. By any political measure, President Johnson has suffered a major psychological setback in New Hampshire. Did he beat expectations? Oh, yeah. He hit it out of the ballpark by expectation standards. I am announcing today my candidacy. Bobby Kennedy smelled weakness and decided to take on Johnson. I run because I am convinced that this country is on a perilous course. At month's end, the chaos of Vietnam forced Johnson to deliver an address to reassure the nation. Joseph Califano and another aide worked on the speech. People <coughs> said, you know, there's, there's no real ending. And what did that mean? Somebody may be writing an ending for him, we thought. I do not believe that I should devote an hour or a day of my time to any personal partisan causes. And then the world changed. I shall not see. And I will not accept the nomination of my party for another term as your president. 
Roger, uh, no question about it, this was a bombshell politically. You really don't know where to begin. Johnson's shocking decision to quit the race was a desperate gamble, born of exhaustion, and the belief that without having to worry about politics, he could negotiate a final peace. Everybody was stunned. Nobody expected that. Fred Harris was giving a speech during Johnson's address. Somebody brought me a note. The AP is reporting that Johnson has declared he's not running again. I mean, you want to read that to the crowd? And I said, no, I don't believe it. I, I'm not going to read it. I know I was in tears, but I'm not exactly sure whether it was joy or whether it was a kind of, of history that was overwhelming, really overwhelming. The agonies of the next few months would almost rip the country apart. I heard somebody holler, Lord. Four days later, Martin Luther King was assassinated. Now it's on to Chicago and let's win there. Two months after that, Robert Kennedy was assassinated. Senator Kennedy has been shot. After Bobby was killed, McCarthy essentially became a recluse for the next six weeks. I think he made the judgment that some of his particularly younger ones in the campaign couldn't see, which was he wasn't going to get the nomination. McCarthy was right. In August, Democrats gathered in Chicago to nominate Vice President Hubert Humphrey. The city erupted in violence as anti-war protesters were met with a brutal response by police. The Republican nominee was Richard Nixon. He ran against Humphrey as the law and order candidate with a secret plan to end the war. Nixon won. Johnson left Democrats wondering what might have been. He would have wound up probably with a nomination and with the election. It wasn't an automatic that he would lose. It would have been a tough role, but there was every chance he could win. Instead, the war, which would drag on for another six years, had claimed another casualty. The presidency of Lyndon Johnson. Thank you for listening. Good night, and God bless all of you. Johnny Carson, which will, I think will surprise you, was the shyest man I've ever dealt with. The man who taught TV to talk. Throw things. <laughs>